So great to see all, all of you uh, here. And uh, there is a nice overflow room with some additional coffee and water where it's actually cooler. So we had some uh, 15, 20 people uh, watching the discussion from over there. And we have about 50 uh, from all over Europe uh, following us on the, on the Facebook uh, page. Um, so great continuation of the discussion. So I will hand over to uh, Edgar Spasters, who is the uh, legal counselor for the association, Finance Latvia Association, and uh, Martin Schberzinj, the Citadelle lead uh, for digital channels, right? Exactly. So we, um, these two um, gentlemen are actually very much in the background of the uh, new cabinet of ministers regulations on the remote electronic identification. And as, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the discussion, we've actually uh, been getting quite a number of questions from various industry players on the meaning of different articles and, and what to take out of this. And so we thought this is a good occasion to, uh, to delve deeper and, and uh, with the hope that this is all in the interests of the consumers that will not need to go anywhere in person uh, very soon. Welcome to the second part of this seminar. I'm terribly sorry interrupting your coffee break, but uh, uh, we hope that our presentation will, will be worth it. Uh, so we both, uh, me and Martin, uh, had an opportunity to uh, draft the legislation and participate in discussions in the drafting process, and uh, it would be unfair not to share those, this knowledge and uh, those insights with you. So my background mostly is, uh, uh, I pre before joining Finance Latvia Association, I was a senior associate at Cobalt Legal, uh, and before that, uh, uh, legal counsel to Auditor General. Uh, and before that, I worked for the Parliament of Latvia, uh, developing, drafting a lot of pieces of legislation. So that's my main business, actually, to draft new regulations. And that was an opportunity I wouldn't miss. Uh, you remember we met six months ago when uh, there was a seminar on 26th of January uh, when we discussed possible solutions and how to shape the uh, new regulation regarding client remote digital onboarding. And now those six months has passed. On 3rd of July this year, Cabinet of Ministers passed the new regulation. And uh, today we will look into this regulation and give some kind of commentary to all those uh, provisions put in this regulation. So, uh, when we draft this regulation, um, some people asked, why do you need so detailed provisions put, because as already some of you mentioned in the previous part of the seminar, technology develops, why do you need to regulate technology, will, what will be developed in, 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 will be already old in one or two uh, months. But, you know, there's fifth ML directive, which says, and explicitly demands an express purpose regulation of the process how the client is digitally and remotely onboarded. So it can't be just only a provision that you, sh you should use uh, licensed or sound or proper or safe security, uh, safe technology. You should be, this technology should be regulated uh, and should be recognized by national authorities. So that is why this regulation was needed to recognize the methods of uh, remote client identification. Uh, the delegation is only for those firms who are, uh, who are subjected to special obligations under IML and, counter uh, and terrorist finance regulations. I, I'll call them obliged entities, as 5th IML and 4th IML directive does. So other firms can follow and deduce the same approach, but they are not obliged by it. So other firms can only copy the same approach, can develop it, uh, their own, uh, but uh, this regulation is binding only for obliged entities, uh, not all firms who are uh, onboarding customers remotely. Uh, as I already said, the technology always develops faster than law, but uh, the purpose of law is to protect public interests of society. That's why this interference was necessary, and uh, that is why regulation inframes the process and methods, and, but it lets businesses to compete over uh, best technologi technological solution. So it's not inframed. Inframed are only four methods used for customer identification, but how to use it, how to use it better, faster, and cheaper. It's open for, for businesses to compete on this. 
uh, we must recognize that remote uh, client uh, identification creates a greater risk than, it, than uh, on spot identification. For example, uh, when a client arrives, probably with not very good things in his mind, probably it could be even a homeless person. Some person will is accompanying him and directing him, controlling him. You will notice it at the, at the same moment. Uh, we'll call security, ask additional questions, and prevent uh, this client from onboarding. But in uh, remote uh, client onboarding, this is not so obvious, and such client could be onboarded even without noticing it. So you must recognize that such risks uh, exist. They have to be identified. You have smart solutions to identify and prevent those risks and mitigate the risks and uh, And that's why the basic principles of this regulation is risk-based approach to identify risks and mitigate them, address only key issues, and leave the detail to businesses. So the details, has le uh, was le uh, the details are left to businesses, so there is a room for new technology to develop. For example, even blockchain to be used uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, remote client identification. And, of course, this regulation acknowledges the risks originating from such countries as CIC, for example, countries like Russia, countries with high level of corruption, and in those cases, several methods can't be used or they are put, uh, there are some transaction limits uh, put uh, uh, regarding those uh, clients from those countries or, country or clients whose UBOs come from uh, countries with high level of corruption. So, obliged entities are empowered to choose to which countries, nationals, it will offer remote digital client onboarding. Uh, the regulation doesn't frame a list of countries. Actually, it could be like America, China, France, Lithuania, Estonia, Sweden, but only obliged entities are empowered to choose to which countries they will, to which countries, nationals, it will offer remote digital onboarding. And if they choose to, the obliged entity has to, uh, has to know the patterns, fraudless activities, scenarios uh, existing existing in those countries. They should be the obliged entity should be um, uh, demonstrate the knowledge of of IDs of such uh, of, those, of those countries and uh, how to deal with uh, fraudulent activities of those countries' nationals. Uh, if the obliged entity can demonstrate that uh, it has full knowledge of that, that it is allowed to work with the clients coming from those countries. So, the, con uh, moving on on margin discretion, uh, only obliged entity decides whether to offer a more digital onboarding uh, and the method to be used. So, from uh, one of four methods or two methods combined, it's only about, on, only, uh, uh, obliged entity to choose. Uh, obliged entity is also empowered to cancel remote digital onboarding or ask for on-spot identification at any time uh, without even explanation. So I would like to meet this client in person that the obliged entity is empowered to ask uh, such thing at any time without any explanation. Uh, as I already told the obliged entity must demonstrate the knowledge to manage and mitigate risks arising from non of uh, onboarding customers from particular countries, especially countries more to the east from Latvia. Uh, and of course, proper and comp comprehensive risk assessment is needed. Uh, it's one of the first con uh, conditions to start offering this service. Uh, manuals for fraud, uh, forgery typologies, and new trends, and knowing the new trends is a must. Uh, Applicability. Uh, this regulation, at first we thought that uh, this regulation could be applied only to, to private individuals, but actually uh, in, at the end uh, we decided that it could be more efficient that this regulation applies to natural, both to natural persons and legal entities. So even legal entity can be onboarded uh, uh, via this regulation. Uh, it applies both to new clients and, for example, a client who was already identified but for example, a member of the board has changed and you need to, to onboard this uh, member of board as well to identify him. So the circulation could be in this respect as well. 
Uh, this regulation doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, include no, uh, additional requirements in regards to enhanced due diligence. Uh, so those requirements are those who are provided by law or, or FCMC regulations. For example, if the uh, transaction limit is exceeded, and, and then you should, uh, you should perform uh, enhanced due diligence. Or for example, the, it's a, your client is a casino, so that's why you need to perform uh, enhanced due diligence. Uh, some uh, other points. So th this regulation does not apply to existing client authentication to access banks' online services. So that's a different thing. Uh, it shouldn't be uh, put together. Um, of course, the method used to authenticate uh, or to identify a client might be affect what kind of tools are accessible uh, to the client uh, when he's, uh, he or she is accessing banks' online services. For example, if, it's, if the client is uh, onboarded via selfie, it, it, this client probably won't get access to uh, qualified identification tools provided by the bank. Uh, one more thing that uh, according to the credit institution law, uh, introducing uh, remote digital onboarding might be affected and might be subjected to the FCMC approval as a new service, uh, financial service provided by the, for example, by the bank. So the banks usually will be asked to uh, obtain FCMC approval prior to start providing client remote identification. So in regards to methods, probably I'll ask Martin to continue. My name is Martin Berzinch. I'm uh, head of the digital channels at Citadel Bank. And uh, before jumping uh, into the methods and uh, starting uh, explaining every single of these methods, um, I briefly wanted to share uh, this uh, thinking behind the process, what we had when we were working during the, this uh, work group sessions. And I would say that uh, this was really very challenging uh, work because we were trying to balance two things. Technology, which is all the time developing, and this is something what we believe is like opening uh, all the doors. And on the same time, um, we are uh, regulated by certain laws, and there is uh, like legal environment all around these things. And I think that uh, for me, having um, experience prior to the Citadel Bank working um, also as a, a board member responsible for AML for first licensed uh, payment institution in Latvia, uh, FinTech, it was also like a great opportunity see, uh, seeing not just these technical opportunities, but also uh, talking with um, Edgars, with other um, persons involved in uh, this work group. Uh, to balance really and find uh, the ways uh, how we could uh, move forward with this uh, regulation. So what we had uh, thinking behind this whole thing. So if you are looking at the process currently at the banks or when we are just, uh, it, it maybe not just a bank but it could be any service provider when we face customer fa um, face to face, we basically are not having any differentiators. What is going to be the customer requirements, what products or services uh, he or she are going to be using. And um, um, so what is this particular risks, uh, this person's risk profile? So we are just assuming that uh, when we do certain, um, let's say procedure for the person, uh, the keys to the kingdom are open and um, he can do basically everything. And of course, um, the world is changing, so all the transactions in the world in our daily lives are changing and uh, we are looking for service providers who, want, who can provide us services and we can apply 24 by 7 and uh, start using services immediately. So, and the customers are also, like I said, quite different. There might be somebody who is having necessity having account for let's say average 1000 euro turnover per month maybe somebody uh, for 10 15 and um, somebody who is having even much larger necessity for the money and the transactions so also the products and also the services what what might be needed for these customers 
are, are very different. So, uh, like Edgar's mentioned, we had this risk-based approach and we tried to slice, uh, basically, all these products and services, um, including uh, like uh, necessity to identify person by the notary. So, this law is not just uh, applicable for financial sector. There is really like wide spectrum of the people who are involved and might be using this uh, so that uh, some of these authentication methods are simpler, some are, uh, some are requiring highly more transactions, more uh, KYC questionnaire, but uh, it gets kind of balanced. And at the end of the day, the institution or service provider who is running this service is deciding based on his regulatory needs what is best suitable for him. And like also Edgar's mentioned, it's not just uh, like selecting one of these methods. It could be a combination of these methods. It could be something else, but what has the steps included in some of these uh, methods. So um, I think that was uh, important uh, before we start uh, briefly going through these uh, questions to understand uh, this whole picture because uh, some, some of these authentication methods seem simple, some slightly harder. So uh, clearly um, electronic signature being one of the method is not a big surprise. It has been also used in um, other European countries uh, as well. And um, we basically are uh, requiring uh, ADIS scheme, and um, but uh, we, we we know that electronic signature has also a lot of other application forms. We can communicate with the government. There is like different uh, ways of transactions, but currently, at least uh, in Latvia and other countries besides Estonia, uh, Estonian signature uh, unfortunately is not that widely used. There is a certain um, uh, uh, I would say uh, ideas from the Latvian government and I hope uh, it, it will really get through and uh, electronic signature is going to get more widely used uh, but uh, besides the Latvian electronic signature which is delivered by LVRTC there also could be other electronic signatures which could be used. So basically we are talking about the CAS qualified electronic signature which is required for digital onboarding. Then I think a quite well known method is also this uh, video identification uh, which is uh, maybe some of you have seen the N26 um, onboarding process so it's very similar to this uh, Swiss German uh, model um, and uh, it's, it's universal, secure, uh, it could be used by really different uh, service providers and um, also when we were discussing in a working a work group, uh, this is uh, probably one of the solutions what the banks are quite uh, widely going to use. So uh, then uh, inside the law we are also having uh, this identification payment as well as a method. But here it is very important to understand that this uh, method already by law has been created for like smaller, smaller transactions like possibility to taking uh, loans and uh, the most important here is to remember, remember that uh, uh, when we talk um, about uh, uh, remote identification or this method used you cannot really open the account which could be further used for the further identification of purposes. So basically, this is an identification method which stops using um, this onboarded customer for any other transactions besides the one for uh, which uh, it has been created. So, and last but not uh, the least method uh, which is also described in uh, regulatory papers is a selfie and um, identity document photo. So I think uh, here we can see many, many examples, uh, not just across uh, Europe, but also across uh, Baltics. Um, so here, again, we can talk um, about uh, like 
low risk, uh, uh, lower volume transaction related business. And uh, it could be basically, basically used uh, also by fintechs, uh, maybe even the banks, uh, e-money institutions, firms. It's just a question, what kind of product, what kind of service you are providing with this digitally onboarding process um, to your customer? So here is like really very long uh, description uh, about the video identification. Um, I believe I'm, I'm not going through this in, in case there will be the questions. Uh, we can uh, dig deeper on this, uh, but um, in, in general, idea is that this uh, video conferencing should, couldn't be interrupted. In case it's interrupted, the process starts again. And also, um, you cannot really um, delete this conference. It should have certain timestamps, uh, signatures. It should be kept uh, for validating purposes. During this video call, you are also doing the whole biometry um, information scan, validation, and running additional KYC questions. Uh, talking about uh, rule-based restrictions, so uh, Edgar has already mentioned that uh, basically any of the organizations should consider who, who is going to be their customer or, or uh, who is going to take this service. Um, we are talking um, about um, like um, how you can apply and use some of these particular forms like uh, methods uh, like uh, this um, um, photo uh, and selfie. Uh, we believe that uh, really uh, that it could be more applicable for EU um, residents. And, uh, but, but like I said, every organization can decide what really is going to be their customers. And um, I think that um, what is uh, another interesting thing uh, to uh, mention here, that uh, in regulation there is no any, uh, let's say, levels of uh, money indicated for any of these methods. The only uh, restriction or, or any um, threshold what we have been uh, mentioning f as a transaction limit is uh, 3,000 euros um, for um, uh, PEPs and uh, also casinos, which is already like mentioned in, uh, I think, other legal documents as uh, well. Mentioned. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, like, uh, yeah, so basically, basically these are the key, key things. And uh, back to you, Edgar. Uh, Thank you. Continuing about, for example, PEPs, that probably there are some PEPs here uh, present and uh, they are, want to use financial services as well, for example, paying your parking fee using mobility. So that's what, we, what was in our mind that, that we saw that PEPs shouldn't be restricted from paying parking uh, using mobility. So that's why he can, uh, uh, he can be onboarded uh, in, uh, in mobility using like bank transfer method and he could spend like 3,000 euros in a month. If it exceeds that amount, that of course, uh, you should be onboarded in a different way. So speaking of um, um, uh, PEPs, but not only PEPs, or other risk reducing measures, uh, they could be like used a combination of methods, for example, Here's, here I see my colleague, attorney Maris. For example, what I will do as attorney when uh, I would like uh, <clears throat> ask for the payment uh, uh, in advance payment for a client, so from his bank account and his a photo of his passport. So that's about, and probably I'll ask for his health selfie as well. So I would see, I, I should know my client, you know. Uh, that's why I would, be, I would be like using two methods, combination of two methods. And that's why I'm mitigating risks and. The bank has checked him, and he has sent me his photo and and uh, his um, uh, his selfie. It, it it's useful, for example, for refugee cases. I have dealt with in in, in the past, so it, the person can't be present. He could be like I need his documents and his uh, uh, information about him before even onboarding him and before he arrives in Latvia. So a combination of methods uh, is possible. Of course, it's possible that you at first onboarded client via. 
bank transfer, but later on he, the, the client would like to apply to other services. So that's why you can use video authentication later at a later stage because uh, the client is uh, require, requires uh, other uh, other other services that need more secure and more um, uh, sound uh, identification procedure. For example, like video indication. Uh, for high risk customers from third countries, you know that bank transfer can be used as additional uh, risk mitigating factor and it's not related to uh, onboarding as well. So for example, if you're onboarding client on spot, uh, indication on spot, but you can additionally ask uh, payment from other bank uh, which, uh, where he has an account. So it, it's a different thing. It's not an onboarding thing, it's a risk mitigating thing even you have onboarded this client on spot. Um, the regulation allows to monitor clients' be uh, digital behavior, his social networking, for example, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, so watch what you're doing there. Uh, use of uh, artificial intelligence, utility bills, geolocation, compare a person's voice available on his blog and provided in, 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 in video conference uh, while onboarding and uh, all other stuff. So in, in regards to GDPR, th there is a legal ground to use a lot of data available uh, about this client online. Uh, and this is a, is a possibility for new and new technological solutions which could do the thing better, faster and cheaper. But with more data, of course. Uh, opening a bank account versus establishing a company. Uh, there's a connection, good lilies here, that Ministry of Justice uh, has a good, uh, had a, has a um, proposal to, that foreigners can uh, establish a company in Latvia using electronic signature. And from 2020 or something like that, I'm, 2020, I'm not, mistake, not mistaken, uh, any foreigner, the only way how the foreigner will uh, can, uh, um, establish a company in Latvia will be that he obtains secure electronic signature, for example, in Latvian embassy somewhere, and can open, uh, they can establish a company in uh, online, uh, in state, in, 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 in corporate register. Uh, and banks should keep that in mind, that this, uh, um, this uh, person would like to open a bank account as well. So probably it will be more useful for him to use the same technology using e-signature. E so that's why it, those two things could need to be uh, put in context when uh, deciding which of four uh, methods to introduce in, uh, in your services. So e-signature will, will be a must uh, for establishing a company, the only way and that's why the banks should provide as well uh, this method for uh, client identification as well. So it will be more convenient for the, for, for, for the clients. So are only there four methods? Actually, no. Those, are the, those methods, uh, for example, obtaining selfie and picture of document. You can use any technology in any way how to obtain those two things. We are anything. It's, it's like open for imagination. So that's why we can say those all four methods are like exemption from uh, enhanced due diligence procedure. Uh, but the way how you get the, the information asked in, in those four methods, it's up to you. It's about technological solutions you can provide. But technically, you should obey those four methods. If you don't want to obey those four methods and use like fifth or sixth method, uh, it won't be an exemption from EDD. So you will have to go, go, go undergo EDD procedure for each client uh, identified by those other methods. Uh, so speaking of EDD, uh, uh, that was the main challenge why those why this regulation was needed because only this regulation gives an exemption from undergoing EDD and. Uh, as you know, EDD is performed when the law requires to do so. For example, if you are onboarding a PEP, you should, uh, under, uh, this person should undergo uh, enhanced due diligence. Um, and, uh, but it's not only in, in those cases, obliged entities may perform EDD at any time uh, based on fresh information obtained uh, or, or new risk assessment uh, to mitigate the risks uh, identified in this uh, risk assessment. That's why even this regulation gives like exemption for EDD, it's not like a total exemption. It, it means if you have new information or, or good grounds to perform this procedure, you should do it. Uh, speaking of transitional provisions, so at first there's the, the no transitional provisions is in place. So, uh, but it doesn't mean they, they are not existing here, there. So new client, new regulation apply. But you know, there are older clients 
onboarded before this regulation came into force. Uh, so if this client uh, has been um, onboarded remotely in the past, so you either perform EDD, what you should have done before, actually, uh, but if you haven't done it, so it's possible, uh, you apply the new regulation. So it can be applied for before this regulation came into force, those, for those clients onboarded, uh, you can like uh, onboard them like second time, yeah, but using like video identification or any other of four methods. So it gives you like a space flexibility to deal with your mistakes of the past. Uh, but you know, obliged entities are usually are not doing all, all of those things by themselves. They are outsourcing. And outsourcing is allowed, and there are two key issues uh, to address here. So first of all, um, there is no requirement for a service provider to be registered in the EU. Because if you are reading the regulation, you, at, at first glance, you may be mistaken. It's not ask, the regulation is not asking for registration in the EU. It's asking that this company, this outs, uh, company who will provide the outsourcing uh, for, for um, remote identification, should meet uh, requirements uh, arising from EU anti-money uh, anti laundering rules. So it should demonstrate somehow that it, it's compliant with them, fit and proper. Uh, speaking of outsourcing requirements, uh, for banks, EBA guidelines and coordination with FCMC might be needed. So, at, at, for the banks, at least first, um, FCMC uh, uh, approval to start client remote identification, and secondly, uh, approval for the outsourcing company as well. So, a lot of red tape, I know, but it's worth it. Uh, Speaking of state registers, they were mentioned uh, in the previous, in, in the first part of the seminar. We really have an issue here with them. There are so many of them, you have to deal with them separately. Uh, no need to access population register or you know, other registers to provide the client uh, remote identification. It's not a must, it's not a requirement. You can use it as a risk mitigating measure. It's provided in the regulation as such. Uh, but there is no requirement to have an access to those registers because probably you will onboard Estonian citizen and you, will don't, you, you won't have any access to Estonian population register. Um, there is a problem still. Uh, in, in, uh, in order to provide a loan or a credit card, uh, a customer uh, who is remote, uh, onboarded remotely, uh, the, the company should check uh, uh, as a credit register. Uh, and uh, still the law and the credit register asks uh, to do it in a paper form or e-signature. So Life and Bank was very, uh, uh, it said that, uh, that this um, law will be changed and they, we already agreed on the proposal how to do it, so it was pretty fast, thank you for that. Uh, and uh, after that it, was, it will be amended, we, we could provide uh, credit cards and the loans uh, filed in this register uh, in more flexible form. Now for the banks it, it's an issue because if you want to provide a credit card uh, there is no way to access credit registry but it's an obligation for the bank uh, without paper form or e-signature so selfie or bank transfer is not a solution. So it mostly those two methods now is uh, those methods are more available for non-banking uh, businesses providing loans uh, for customers. Uh, copy of ID, there is a, um, uh, one technical, uh, important technical uh, thing uh, prescribed in the regulation that photo of ID, of the ID taken by the person is considered as a copy of, of the ID in the meaning of the AML law. Otherwise you should like copy it by yourself and uh, sign it via e-signature and <laughs> provide to the company, it will be meaningless for, for, for uh, using selfie methods. So that's why the regulation says your copy is considered a copy in the meaning of the IML law. Uh, in case of onboarding illegal entities, some additional documents should be provided. You can provide it in, via online, via e-signature, or send it via mail, and then, for example, perform video education. Then the, the bank uh, employee will have your, uh, registering, uh, your docu documents of registration, proof of registration, and will like, uh, uh, ask you questions about them and onboard you as a member of the board uh, via video identification. So there might be some some issues to, to think ahead uh, 
to send the documents to the bank before onboarding a legal entity uh, and only then perform, for example, video identification. Uh, and if, if Martin has no, nothing to add, uh, there's a question and answer questions. Uh, and before going, before uh, uh, letting you ask, um, uh, ask your question, uh, I was wondering, I really didn't uh, uh, look in the participants list, is there anybody here who is like a developer, who is developing uh, uh, some, applica uh, some apps for, for uh, uh, remote digital onboarding? So, oh, there's like four of them, so maybe you will have additional questions. So you were the, you were the, fir so you were the first, so please ask your question. Yes, Alexander Dolinsky from Velvet Finance. Uh, actually, one of the questions would be how you think uh, about um, automatic check of person uh, as member of board in official registry, what law is saying on that. So let's example, I am identifying myself as private person at payment institution and as next step I want to open corporate account. Uh, can I as payment institution, go to public registry, just check that this person is like with name and ID code is same person which is in registry and open account based on this, or it's uh, still not enough in terms of IML policy. If you still not enough, you you will have to like sign an application that you want to open account as a business, not as a as a private individual. Uh, probably provide some additional documents prescribed by law and then, and then the bank will open your account because it, it, it won't be much of red tape there. It, it, regardless of you, what you say, the bank uh, always will check public register whether you are a member of the board or not. So it, it'll need, you'll need to f fill some forms, but that's, that's it. So it, it, it usually won't happen so automatically. You should provide an additional information. Well, if uh, if you may, to switch to customer perspective, uh, please correct me if I, if I'm wrong. But if uh, I interpret one article, that bank has a right to uh, freeze an account and uh, terminate all the services if it finds uh, problems uh, during this remote or, or identification procedure or, or 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 just something was suspicious, right? I, I do not want that Martin takes it personally. Let's think that account servicing, payment service providers, provider open the account for the customer. And, and, and then how to explain the customer that he still is protected and that actually there will be no situation when, for example, due to bank's mistake or error, he will suffer, for example. Uh, do bank will have or let's say financial services provider, have obligations towards FSA to explain the reason because there is no obligation to explain the reason to the consumer. Uh, I'll Martin will continue that the provision is, if you speaking of a new client, probably if the client is just like to be onboarded, he will definitely uh, won't have any account. Uh, but if it is an existing client and, for example, it's a legal entity and you, have, you are onboarding a new member of the board, for example, that could be an issue, what we are talking about. The second thing, that customer is onboarded, the account, account is open, uh, and then bank uh, realizes that uh, something went wrong. Yeah, that, and uh, physically identifies uh, himself without there, a reason. Well, usually, I, I think that there is no... Um, statutory reason to not to explain it because it's not an AML issue. It's uh, like a, um, could be a, a mistake in in, in, in the indication process. Uh, and the bank can say, you know, we will, we, uh, the regulation ask, uh, ask the bank to refrain from transactions until this issue has been resolved. So you have to come and then, yeah, or to use other method of identification or repeat the same one. It's not only on-spot registration as an alternative. You could be, okay, we can do video identification uh, in 10 minutes if you are ready and or, or repeat the same identification once more without making the same mistake what we did in the first place. So maybe Martin Schwilk can. Yeah, so uh, Edgar's partially covered what I was planning to tell. So basically this whole process is more about the new customers. And you are at the end, you should be sure if you are ready to open an account, if you are the bank or financial institution and you are reporting to FCMC and uh, you are basically taking the whole responsibility or not. 
So if you are starting this process and by any means you believe that uh, either, for example, these photos or videos were in too dark conditions and uh, the system is not, um, let's say, fully uh, ready to tell that by 99 point something percent this is this person, um, is the same person who he tries to present, uh, you can ask him to either try one more time this particular onboarding method, or try other method, or come to the branch. Because uh, this is really like a question about uh, how big risk are you taking, because besides this whole process when you are doing the onboarding, you should be performing also validation of the documents and you should check if really this passport exists, if this person is capable of um, doing business and opening accounts. So it's, it's really like accessing the whole all databases, what you can gather based on this uh, document set which you are going to use and then doing a decision if you are really opening this account or not. I cannot really comment uh, about these situations which are happening when already this account has been opened and then by something your bank decides there is like a lot of different procedures, laws and uh, different, and there could be anything, but the most uh, common one is AML related one. Uh, why bank's account could be freezed and uh, we would be probably asking from the person more information on this. As a, apart from legal stuff, if I were at the bank and I made mis made mistake, I would like apologize to customer and uh, somehow reward him. So that's like a business business thing: how to be nice uh, and decent, not not uh, just only legal stuff, and that's all. Yeah. So any uh, maybe some developers, one of them already asked his question. Maybe uh, some other from you. Do you have some first impressions of this regulation? Is it good or not very good? Um, yeah, I want to uh, elaborate a totally different angle because recently I worked with one interesting project. It's called Humanique. Uh, it's blockchain solution for identification and financial inclusion of unbanked. And there I, I was struck that there is like 2 billion people in the world who are unbanked, unidentifiable, and that's like a major problem. And if you would uh, include this, give opportunity these people to be to to be identifiable, to open bank account, it actually may, makes enormous impact on on global economy. And like I, I, I think that financial inclusion is one of the key elements in order to 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 reach this sustainable development goal by UN. So I would like you to elaborate more about this uh, um, ability of companies to choose with whom, with whom to work or with whom to discriminate or not to work. Uh, you mentioned several times like Russian. There, there's some, yeah, there's like a lot of fraud in Russia. There are decent people in, in Russia. Like I'm, I am personally like, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's probably the last country that will be that will be uh, uh, there uh, applicable because there is like highly inefficient government. It's mecca for 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 this all this corruption. But what I have to do with it? Yeah. So basically, if I'm if I have positive record and I want to do business, if I want to be identifiable here in European Union in in Latvia, why there there is this uh, like uh, national identity playing of the very first step of it? Thank you for the question. First of all, the, the speaking of the first law of the bank uh, from the bank's perspective. Uh, if you look, for example, to, I don't know, Revolut or N26 examples of uh, remote uh, client identification as a best, uh, like most commonly known examples, they, they also uh, de uh, define the, the list of countries with whom they are working or not. Uh, and, for example, in N26 list, Latvia is not on this list uh, anymore. So it's not only about Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's, it's also about Latvia. Yeah? Uh, it's not about Russia or other countries, it's about 
is this current financial institution able to mitigate risks coming from this country? Uh, 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 does this uh, institution know uh, how to deal with uh, uh, the IDs of this, of this country? Are those IDs provided in this country secure and safe enough for for remote um, onboarding? Because there are like a list of requirements for those uh, documents as well. So it's it. it it will be only about, uh, up to this financial institution whether they can mitigate those risks or not. Uh, statutory requirements concern only countries uh, with high level of corruption, for example, uh, or sanctioned countries. Uh, then those two last methods, bank transfer and, um, and uh, selfie, is not allowed more than 3,000 euros. Uh, Apart from this, video identification or electronic signature, there's, there are no restrictions in this regard. So, but usually, uh, I think that most, uh, taking into account Latvian uh, issues with, with non-resident uh, presence here, so it will be probably a pretty conservative approach at first. Uh, like first, at first, the European countries or Baltics, and after that, only third uh, countries. Martic, maybe more. Yeah. So. Uh yeah, that's true that we mentioned uh, maybe for certain methods, these exclusions, right? But um, what is, imp again, important to understand, what are these risks which Edgar has mentioned? And when we talk about these risks, it's a question about, about how big money are we talking in these cases. So if we talk uh, like about this, uh, maybe some micro payments, or if we believe that um, this is a tourist who is traveling, of course, uh, there needs to be like the simplest out, uh, onboarding uh, as, as possible and possibility to provide certain uh, payment methods. It could be payments using a phone. Obviously, the NFC is growing and it could be that maybe there is no credit uh, card involved, uh, there is maybe some kind of virtual debit card or maybe even physical card. But this is up to really the service provider to decide what is going to be my product? What is going to be my service? What is my business case? And who are my customers? And then, uh, like uh, there has been also uh, several references in the slides as well, there might be a requirement to go and discuss this uh, with a regulator. So in case, from some perspective, it believe, uh, you, you believe that you can prove that these risks are not high, because it's targeted for certain people, the amount of money is this and this, it might be used by certain merchants, then this is, again, something what you can uh, play with. So um, I would say that when we talk really about these video identifications and when we talk about the electronic signatures, uh, it, it, it's more like really uh, providing uh, top level services where maybe customer expects to have quite high turnovers into, in, in, into these accounts. And then, of course, there is like a necessity to decrease these uh, risks. Let me, be a, let me be a bit cynical. Uh, the calculation is pretty simple. For example, I ha I'm, a, I'm a bank. I have like uh, one million customers. Uh, customers from Bosnia and Herzegovina could be like 1,000 in my bank, but uh, reports to FIU is 10,000. Uh, 10,000 from uh, regarding your country. What would I do? What should I do? Okay. Of course, the, 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 if the client base is 10% 10, 10 from the reports I'm giving to FIU about nationals of particular country, of course, the, the business calculation is pretty simple. On offboard those clients. Don't work with this country. You can't mitigate those risks. It's not reasonable. It's only loss, it's not profit. So that's a business calculation. It's pretty simple in this case. And from this perspective, all, all financial institutions are, are, are making their decisions. Um, okay, doesn't matter. I'll try to speak loud. Uh, so I have a question about this method number four. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I have a question regarding the, uh, the identification method number four, um, which is uh, basically identity verification of a person's selfie and uh, identity photo. Uh, as compared to number two, which is video interview. It seems that this method number four is, uh, is somewhat a lesser um, or a complementary method as opposed to the video interview. Uh, whereas in, in most other countries, well, not most, but at least in some other countries, uh, it, it can be used as a main method without any restrictions. Like, in, for instance, in Lithuania, they, um, the selfie method uh, is, is used um, without any restrictions. So the law, Lithuanian law, says that after you have done the self-identification, you should sign it by electronic signature. In Latvian law, just a selfie and the document scan. Mm -hmm. No signature. May I explain? It's not a complementary method. Video identification where you provide your document is one method, separate method. The method that you're taking selfie and then the photo of identity document like you, you do in Revolut application, app, mostly of them uh, of here present probably have done it. Uh, in this case, it, it's a separate method. Only two restrictions apply. First of all, to countries with um, like higher risks of IML, like high corruption level, sanctioned countries. So, to the nationals of those countries, this method uh, does not apply. And the second restriction is for PEPs, uh, for example, PEPs or other. Uh, entities uh, who must undergo uh, ADD procedure, like casinos, for example, as I have already mentioned. For those, there are like a uh, volume limit for 3,000 euros in a month. Apart from that, it's, it is a four separate method. It's not complementary to video identification. And without e signature, like in Lithuania, as Martin Stone. So, one more question here. So, the last two questions. So. <laughs> and Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask why have you not considered such widely used uh, methods of identification as a fingerprint recognition and voice recognition? What about those two? Because for sure I know that in the UK, for example, they're very widely used. Yeah, it, I, it would be great. Name the question? Okay. Uh, so the question is about like once we onboarded the customer, there is a need further to do some activities with the customer, like make payments, change uh, con contract conditions, and uh, how the customer could use non qualified authentication means for this uh, purpose, like let's say pin generators. Since like electronic documents law says you have to agree in written form uh, in order to further to perform some transactions or use like qualified electronic signature. And same goes for authentication, yep. So regarding the first question, uh, that, uh, the answer will be the, the first question. Uh, we would like to provide uh, uh, this uh, biometrics as a, as, a, as a method of identification of the person, but there's one difference between UK. The UK government has provided a database accessible to compare is my face the face which is stored in the governmental database or fingerprint stored there, is it my fingerprint? And as we lack such an uh, infrastructure here, or such an opportunity to use biometric data even for IML purposes uh, in, in, in banking, though that is why this method wasn't included, but it would be great to include such method, but it's upon the government to use bi biometric data for such purposes. If our government will be ready for that, we will too. And the second question, um, probably it concerns like so I, I, I just will try because I, I didn't catch the whole idea. So uh, idea was that uh, I have been onboarded, but I would like to change certain conditions. And then I need to give a consent, which currently by law requires electronic signature or paper written form, right? So here we are basically uh, thinking that uh, you there is like initial terms and conditions. So there is like um, possibility to agree when you are introducing certain um, electronic services, also like the banks does, and there is other service providers. You can agree what is the methodology, how you are going to sign these documents. It could be like your PIN, which you have created, for example, by using mobile application or any other way. So besides, 
these traditional ones, when you are opening and creating the terms and conditions with a customer, you are having this uh, contract, you are agreeing, and basically a customer then needs to agree. If this has not been agreed, then yes, then, then all the changes could be done either by having face-to-face -face meeting or by electronic signature or, or you know, paper signed form. So in the last okay. question. Yeah, so uh, while drafting the law, did you look at the past uh, use cases like N26 or Revolute to exclude certain nationals from the e-identification process? Because certain of those, like Monzo, N26 or Revolute, few of them include certain nationalities, few of them does not include certain nationalities. So there is no similarity between uh, like uh, same. Like for my case, I, I would say because I am an EU, EU resident with an Indian passport. I have a Revolut account, but N26 doesn't give Revolut uh, N26 accounts to Indian citizens. But they uh, look at the same methodology of e-onboarding. E so uh, did you look at certain use cases for that and how did you uh, arrive at a certain uh, decision that, okay, we will go by this? Uh, okay, thank you for the question. Uh, as I already told you, that the margin of discretion is upon the financial institution. So this institution uh, can decide whether to cooperate with particular countries, so this, those country nationals or not. Uh, there could be a pattern or could be, or, or even not, like in this, the N26 this list and Revolt list, they are different, of course. It depends on the calculation I've already told you about how many clients, percentage of the clients on your client base you have and uh, what, what kind of problems they are creating. Can you mitigate the risks arising from this country? So it's margin of discretion. There is no legal provision uh, by saying uh, not to cooperate with those countries and cooperate with, with other countries. The only uh, uh, thing that this regulation uh, include is that uh, uh, you can't use those uh, less safe, less secure methods for countries who can be considered um, like with high IML risk, high corruption risk, and sanctioned countries. Only those countries, like object, uh, objective criteria uh, is present there, uh, but no like discriminatory uh, practices like to add like uh, annex to the regulation say you can cooperate only with those countries or countries in, uh, include uh, in the EU. So this regulation is pretty open. It's about how you can mitigate the risks. If you can, you can cooperate even with China or with Japan or Australia or the United States, India. It's upon the financial institution depending on, on its risks, risk, risk assessment uh, and the business model. We've also committed to uh, finish in a certain time, so we're about 25 minutes uh, over the, the planned uh, end. Uh, let me give a quick applause to the... Uh, to the And in closing, I would just say I think this this particular piece of, of uh, discussion on the remote electronic identification is really a, a signature piece in, in the way the industry players across the uh, subsectors came together in, in, in Latvia. And, and um, in fact, it took us quite a number of public discussions. We started out last year as part of the Digital Freedom Festival discussion on remote electronic identification, followed up with another discussion as part of the Digital Freedom Festival and we had a, an event in Stockholm on Nordic Vision of Financial Industry followed by a discussion on the 26th of January with, with a range of partners. And so tremendous thanks to the Ministry of Justice uh, who's present here in the Ministry of Finance for taking the leadership and, and, and being um, um, through discussions becoming more and more open and, and arriving at regulations that we believe actually sets out a very good framework that we will no doubt will need to adapt um, in, in the months and years to come as, as the practice shows, but it's... it's, it's uh, really um, bringing out the best from the industry and the collaboration that we built. So hope with that we build out the same on the blockchain topic as the first part of, of the day. And as I close, um, 
I think it would be uh, uh, Christine Menica is not here, uh, but I told her that I will say thanks at the end. Uh, she's left. She's been uh, in, in the back of organizing and pulling this uh, event together. Tremendous thanks to our partners, Everschutz, uh, Betans, and of course the European Commission, and to all the speakers and, and, and the partners from, uh, from uh, Latvia, uh, from Estonia, and, and, and Lithuania. So we are committed to continue these kind of discussions uh, and, and sharing the experiences, and we are very committed to do this on a pan Baltic level so that's how we how we look at the world so thanks a lot and uh, you have yes and, uh, our presentations will be available online uh, in our on our homepage on Monday and uh, of course as uh, uh, we, we have translated the new regulation uh, regarding remote client education it will be available on our website as well so it's uh, joint with the, with the Ministry of Finance in, info, info sheet on, on, on this particular topic. So with that, uh, let us close and a tremendous thanks for being here.